right, so here is um, this little holder here. Yeah, this is a, a battery holder. I actually got these by accident, but I was like, these are kind of cool. These are used in like little toys or like wearable jewelry. This is a coin cell holder with a little button in it and a little bit of circuitry, and it goes through flashing modes. So even though it's like a, a coin cell holder, you know, and it provides three volts to whatever you've got, when you press the button, it goes through three different modes. Uh, fast flash, slow flash, and then constant on, and then of course, uh, you press again it goes off um so you know i think yes it's used for leds and little led decorations but i think there could be also projects where you want something to not be on all the time or you you, you want to um you know maybe make some uh you know i'm thinking like um folks who do uh squishy circuits or other basic electric you know electronic circuits where you don't want to have a microcontroller blinking an led you could just use this instead so let's uh Go to the overhead and I can show off uh, the demo. So I actually have it with the, the other LED product I'm going to show off. This is a gigantic LED with a diffuser. I press it once and uh, turns on. Uh, fast flashing. Press it again. Hold on, my, my camera is like so upset. Hold on. Okay, sorry. So you press it off, fast flashing slow flashing click again on constantly and then press one more time to turn off so i think it's still pretty handy it comes with bare wires i've soldered them on or you can use alligator clips to connect to uh whatever you wish okay next up okay we've got mechanical keys multiple different mechanical keys we've got uh these are reds so these are um kale box reds so you can see uh there's this like box on the top and that's what your uh, keycap plugs into um so these are you know they can you can plug them into our um our neo key our neo key uh breakout boards um they uh are all equivalent to cherry mx's so if you have something that's like cherry mx or cherry mx cherry mx compatible um you can use these so just there's four different colors i'll go through all of them um but they're all mechanically the same size they just have different feelings to them which i'll have to try to be evocative so the reds are linear and they're kind of the most popular so we'll start with those um the next one are the oh, sure this is the, bottom. the bottom that's the bottom yeah you can see they, so. they plug in next up are the kale box blacks so these are a little they're also linear they don't have any sound um they're a little bit stiffer than the reds some people like the blacks they're equivalent to cherry mx blacks again you know the same uh size and shape they plug into our sockets whatever then there's the red, uh, the browns, um, and the browns are tactile. What does that mean? It's like when you press it, there's a little bit of a bump to them. It's not an audio click, like it isn't, isn't sound loud, but there is like a little bit of a bump so you can feel that's been pressed. Um, and these are equivalent to Cherry Mix browns. And then finally, there's the kale box whites, and these are actually clicky. So if you want loud clicky buttons, these are the clickiest by far. Maybe I'll even take one out and I'll demonstrate the clickiness. So that's me clicking. It's clicky. So these are the clickiest. And then, um, you can feel the clicky. Yeah, why don't you focus in on Yeah, it's tough because it's, it's white. No love, yeah. no love. Contrast there. The browns, again, these are they have, they, I can just feel like, oh, there's a little bit, it's hard to tell. You gotta just feel them. There's a little bit of a bump to them. So you can really feel that you're uh, pressing them. And then um, the, the blacks, which are a little bit uh, stiffer than the reds. And then of course uh, the reds, which I think I stole for a project. So I don't have them here. And then uh, you can get keycaps and uh, anything that has this X top to it. You can see there's a little X to it. Um, snaps onto the box to make for a, a keycap. So, you know, you want a keycap, again, anything that's Cherry MX compatible is within this family. It'll work just fine. You click your clicks content. Okay. And then uh, you had shown this little half circle light up thing Yeah, this is, a, this is an LED. I mean, we have these like strip LED backlights. These are hemisphere ones. I think these are used for like car gauges or something. Um, with LCD car gauges, but 
I'm not sure exactly. Uh, they're kind of cool if you want like a unique shape. Um, they have two LEDs in parallel in them, so provide them with like 30 or so milliamps. Uh, they just look like a white LED, so give them like 3.3 volts. Put a resistor in line if there's more than 3.3 volts going into them. PW on them, again, it's just an LED with a gigantic diffuser. All right, next up. Next up, I squared C Mini. This is a little uh, I squared C helper buddy from um, X Camera Labs. So they make the I squared C driver and the SPI driver. So this is a little mini board that has firmware that can communicate with uh, your computer. They have Python 2 and Python 3 libraries and some other libraries that let you send and receive commands from I squared C devices. Um, so the larger one has like a TFT screen and like debug info and all that good stuff. This one's meant to be small and inexpensive. It's got uh, a FT, uh, sorry, a CP2104 um, USB serial converter chip. So there's drivers available and then it just sends commands back and forth over serial. And uh, this one, what I like about it is it has a STEM IQT uh, compatible port on it. You can also plug in uh, SparkFun quick boards and uh, they come with a cable. So you can just plug in any board with header on it if you'd like. All right, next up. Next up, we've got these NeoPixel dots, and these are funky. I gotta explain these because they are not what they seem. So most NeoPixels, what we call NeoPixels, are basically shift registers. You, when you send them data, the data, you know, you send a strand of data down into the first NeoPixel. The first NeoPixel will take the first three bytes off of the data that's coming through and pass the rest along, kind of bucket brigade the data over. And that's what lets you basically chain as many NeoPixels as you want together. You just keep chaining them and you just send more data. Each one only you know, grabs the data it needs and passes the rest along. Um, and that's why NeoPixels have inputs and outputs because the data comes on the input, gets reduced, and then sent out the output. And these are not, these are prefixed address LEDs. So what's interesting about these LEDs is they are NeoPixel protocol compatible, but they don't have an input and output. They just have a data line. And the LEDs, there's 100 of them, 0 through 99, they are uh, considered uniquely addressed. And if you like, cut the strip and rewire it, it doesn't matter which pixel is, comes first in the strip. They all will respond as if they were in that long strand. This is a little bit of a, of a mind twist, right? Because we're used to like, oh, the first LED is the first LED. In this case, the first LED is pre-programmed to be first and no matter where it is physically on the strand, it will act as the first so one. So if you, if you chop out 50 to 60. It'll still act like 50 to 60, even if you put it at the beginning. Yeah. Very weird. That's good to know. But this, so you're probably like, why would I ever want this? Because here's the thing, you can't have more than 100 pixels. Like, these are pre-addressed. You can't yeah. get another strand. Like, if you get multiple strands and tie them all together, they'll all act the same, right? They, they all one have... One will act like one, two will act like two. Exactly. Yeah. Like, you, if you chain them at the end, there's not going to be, like, you don't yeah. get to extend it. However, there are situations where maybe you have um, a costume or you have a, a build where you don't want to have... You want to have addressable strips, but they have to be like in a tree, like they branch out from a central point, but you still want to address them uniquely. This is what it would be good for, because even though they're all connected to the same input, they act as individual LEDs. Um, or, you know, if you want to have, um, another nice thing is if one pixel breaks, it doesn't break the rest of the strip, right? That's another nice thing about these, because again, that one data line, it's not a bucket brigade, it's all shared. So if one gets cut out, one gets damaged, one gets smashed, it doesn't matter. The rest of the strip still works. So kind of interesting, a little bit weird, um, but kind of cool. I think that there are some situations where people would want them. But just be aware, you don't want to mix these with like normal NeoPixels unless you really know what you're doing. Because if you think about it, like it's, very, it's, it's counterintuitive to how most people are used to now using NeoPixels for like yeah. the last 10 this years. This is like, okay, now it's hard-coded in a weird way. It's hard-coded yeah. and you're probably wondering, hey, can I change the hard-coded address? And the answer no. is no. <laughs> no. We don't know how to do it. There might be, I have no idea how you would do it. All right, next up, we have an update, another version of the Lobe Kit. Yeah, so this Lobe Kit is um, now available with the Raspberry Pi for two gigabyte uh, as a pack. Um, however, we're out of stock on those too. The, we have sold out of all of our Raspberry Pis at the moment of this Broadcast, yeah. that said, we have the pack without the Raspberry Pi. So if you have a Raspberry Pi 4, check it out and you can uh, experiment with the free Microsoft Lobe system for programming your own custom 
AI models. Next up. Um, this SHT31 is a popular uh, temperature and humidity sensor from Sensirion, and we now have it in STEM AQT format. Yay! Same as before, but now in our standard pinout order and uh, physical shape. We also have a little cutout to keep it uh, isolated. Uh, we've been going through and STEM aqt all of our old sensor so uh the sht31 you know and love a great little sensor still has that uh, uh protective cover on it the teflon cover um uh, is a good sensor and uh we have python arduino circuit python code for it and now you plug and play it hey you plug it into that i squared c mini that we showed earlier all right we have two stars to show tonight besides you lady at our community our customers and all of our team first one up First up is the Cutie Pie. Uh, okay, Cutie Pie RP2040 is finally here. We previewed this. It's now live. Uh, it's the same Cutie Pie that is so adorable that you know and love. Now, you can see on the bottom, it's like super powered. Because people were like, how oh, could you make a Cutie Pie M4? And I kind of never got to it. But this is kind of the same. It's, it's going to be as fast as a SAMD51. Uh, it's got 8 megabytes of flash memory. It's got that 130-ish uh, megahertz dual core cortex m0 runs circuit python um there's gonna be an arduino core runs micro python it's got USB C. uh all the goodies so let's maybe uh let me show it off real fast on the overhead and i can give a tour hold on i gotta find my hold on, plug my magical plug can you go magical plug um, so I actually have it uh, controlling some uh, these NeoPixel dots. Um, okay, so uh, USB-C, little fella here. Um, so it's got uh, power pins. So over here you've got your uh, 5 volts ground, 3 volts pin. You've got the SPI pins in the same location, uh, clock, data in, data out. You've got two UART pins, hardware UART, RX, and TX. You've got um, I squared C data and clock, and then Here's something uh, different than the original Cutie Pie for the SAMD21. This is a different I2C port because there's two ports available on the RP2040. So this is uh, the second port. So you actually get two extra pins because these don't conflict with these uh, SDA pins. And then you've got the four analog inputs because there's four analog inputs on the RP2040. You've got the boot button uh, and you've got the reset button. And the boot button after you've... Um, loaded your program you can use this as a, a gpio pin input so you can use this as a user button as well um, after you've booted and then on the bottom uh you've got the rp2040 a crystal again eight megabytes of flash memory um and capacitors and all that good stuff and then uh, this little jumper uh this is uh, for bill binko who always wanted to have a way to have when this is a, a finally has usb host capability published and documented you can use this for usb host as well so it's super adorable and small um it's basically pin compatible as the samd21 cutie pie uh but of course tons more powerful and uh of course it, you know has all the support circuitry oh there's also a neopixel on the front forgot to mention uh, so you can blink uh to your heart's content you know i would like it i think this is going to be a fun and popular board yeah. uh it's really powerful it's got you know 11 ios available for very tiny projects where you don't need all the stuff that the Feather has, you know, battery charging, um, lots of GPIO pins, uh, this will do the job. It's it's very cute. It's also got castellated pads if you'd like to use those. So I think this could be a, a good little engine when you need something very small, very portable. And that USB-C is, you know, it's a wonderful connector. It goes either way. It's nice and strong, um, but easy to use. All right, one of our new boards, Funhouse. Okay, also... We have it double double the goodies this week. So Funhouse is um, our home automation board uh, based on the ESP32 S2, which is uh, now Circuit Python compatible. And recently, uh, I saw 2.0 Espressive Arduino uh, support added for the ESP32 S2, which is great. So we were thinking about doing home automation projects and what would we want in a platform that's really just for home automation. We did a couple projects with the Metro ESP32 S2 to do home automation, but we're like, well, wouldn't it be great if I had all these sensors built in and I had a TFT built in? And there was so much stuff that we were like, oh, hey, can you have this built in that we're like, you know, we should just, we should just make a board that is really designed specifically for home automation um, and hopefully we'll even have um, home assistant support for it as well. So let's look at it on the overhead. So I'll, I'll turn on the TFT in a moment. Okay, I'll zoom out because this is so big. Uh, you already zoomed out? Okay. 
Oh, now we are. You might want to show the, uh... Oops. Okay. There you go. Okay. So, uh, this is the... I'll turn on in a moment. I just want to show things off. I'll remove yeah, the protector. Should. That's good. Uh, right. You should. Uh, but, you know, also show the amazing silkscreen layer. So, silkscreen by Phil B. Uh, did a wonderful job here. Uh, I just said, okay, it's like a, you know, it's like a triangle top board, but he, uh, he took it a step further and made it really goth, which is great. Um, so uh, on the front here, we've got three GPIO buttons. So you get button input, so that's great. This is the reset button, and uh, there's also a little doorbell. It's a piezo buzzer. Uh, this is the on-off switch, so I can plug this in now. And uh, we always like it so that you can uh, turn off things, especially stuff where it's like sensing. So let's uh, turn this off, turn it back on, quite nice. And then uh, we've got the buttons. So if I press this button, you can see this lights up, uh, up and down. And when I press it, it's going to go beep, beep, beep. So that's a little piezo, so good for notifying, doing audio projects. There's a little red LED here just for indication. And, of course, there's five dot star LEDs at the top, which is wonderful. I like it. It's, it's like a little Christmas tree lights on your house. Um, a light sensor if you need one. Uh, and this is kind of neat. Uh, you know, the ESP32 S2 has native capacitive touch support. So we added uh, here is when you touch the crows, the little goth crows, when you touch them, you can see the cap touch number goes up so you can detect uh, capacitive touch as well. And then there's also a slider here, although this code example doesn't have it, but this is a um, five element uh, slider. So you can use this to you know dim your lights or raise volume or lower it. So um, touch the tree to, to change the the volume or or just use a slider control with capacitive touch um, and then down here we have uh, a humidity and temperature and barometric pressure sensor and uh, people are always asking me to add cutouts so it's not affected by the heat of the the wi-fi or power supply so there's a little cutout that's why there's these slots here to keep it as isolated as possible um, you can see the temperature and barometric pressure and humidity here um, and over here is a, a PIR sensor slot. And of course, I forgot to bring it, but you can plug in a PIR sensor into it on the front and it points out um, to do uh, uh, motion detection because that's a common thing for home automation. And then on the back, um, you've got the ESP32 S2 with four, is it two megabytes of PS RAM or four? Can't remember. I think it's two megabytes of PS RAM, four megabytes of flash memory. Um, ESP32 S2, which is great for CircuitPython. We've got good CircuitPython support for it. It's got Arduino support for it as well. Um, it's basically like your ESP32 that people know and love, but it's got USB support, um, which makes it great for CircuitPython. It shows up as a disk drive. Uh, there's a reset button, sorry, a boot button over here for putting it into bootloader mode. And then um, we've put extra Stemma uh, ports over here. So these are analog input ports that you can connect uh, digital or analog sensors to. Um, each one of them is analog input or digital I.O. Um, so you get three ports. So, you know, good for water sensors or um, uh, uh, magnetic relay sensors or relays that you want to control something with. Or, uh, you know, if you want an external louder speaker or, you know, uh, um, other motion type sensors or brake beam sensors. So lots of different sensors that we have in the shop that people want to use for home automation or sensing around their house. Uh, you would plug that into here. And then, of course, you could have the sensor be far away from this board because let's say you want to plug in a water sensor. If the water sensor is on the board, you're going to destroy the board because it's sensing water and it's like it's going to freak out. But if you have the water sensor uh, plugged in here, then you can um, have the wire go far away. It also has a STEMIQT connector here. So you can, of course, connect any one of our I2C uh, devices. Uh, this is the TFT connection and, of course, our favorite USB-C. And then we've got these um, SMT nuts. And here's a, while we were designing this, Phil B said, hey, you know, by the way, um, your design is really close to the same size as a Raspberry Pi mounting holes. Like I was only a few, just by coincidence, when laying out this board. So what we did is we actually made it so it's exactly the same um, hole pattern as a Raspberry Pi. So you could actually, like literally, if you had long screws, you could just screw it onto a Raspberry Pi computer or use a Raspberry Pi case or accessory. Um, so you can actually kind of act as like a, a Pi shield and do all the sensing stuff for you that the Raspberry Pi, it, you know, that would maybe run Home Assistant and this would do your sensing, your NeoPixels, your button inputs. Good. Analog it, to digital conversion. Analog to digital conversions. Yeah. Even the DAC, it's got a DAC built in so it can do digital to analog. Wow. All that stuff. It's like a home automation touch. hat. Yeah. Like I, I mean, I think also you could have it be remote and control, you know, communicate over Wi-Fi. 
So I think like, you know, we've been playing with the Home Assistant a little bit and other home automation projects. So I think that this is kind of like what would be a really good base for home automation projects using CircuitPython or Arduino or using it with Adafruit IO. So we've got a couple that we've made. We're still manufacturing some more. Um, we'll get them into the shop. So if you've got ideas for home automation, um, check this out. See if this will do what you want. If not, let us know what, what other sensors you want to be able to plug into it to extend and create your own custom um, home, home automation projects. Thank you.